Welcome to Reality Asserts Itself on The Real News Network. I'm Paul Jay. In his book, Method and Madness, Norman Finkelstein wrote, Israel's evolving modus operandi for restoring its deterrence capacity describes a curve steadily regressing into barbarism. Israel gained its victory in 1967 primarily on the battlefield, I'll bet in a, quote, turkey shoot, while in subsequent hostilities, mostly in Lebanon, it sought both to achieve a battlefield victory and to bombard the civilian population into submission. But Israel targeted Gaza to restore its deterrence capacity because it eschewed any of the risks of conventional war. It targeted Gaza because it was largely defenseless. Further down, Norman writes, a supplementary benefit of this deterrence strategy was that it restored Israel's domestic morale. A 2009 internal UN document concluded that the invasion's, quote, one significant achievement, end quote, is, was that it dispelled doubts among Israelis about, quote, their ability and the power of the IDF to issue a blow to its enemies. The use of excessive force proves Israel is the landlord, dot, dot, dot. The pictures of destruction were intended more for Israeli eyes than those of Israel's enemies. Eyes starved of revenge and national pride. Near the end of his book, Norman writes, in the Gaza Strip, they, meaning the people of Gaza, preferred to die resisting rather than continue living under an inhuman blockade. The resistance is mostly notional, as the makeshift projectiles cause little damage. So the ultimate question is, do Palestinians have the right to symbolically resist slow death punctuated by periodic massacres, or is it incumbent upon them to lie down and die? Again, joining us in the studio is Norman Finkelstein. Thanks for joining us again, Norman. Thank you so much. So just quickly, again, Norman is one of the foremost scholars of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, and as I mentioned, his latest book, Method and Madness, The Hidden Story of Israel's Assaults on Gaza. So talk about this deterrence capacity, uh, the, this, the, the necessity of Israel to prove what it's, the destruction it's capable of wielding. All right, well, Israel, it's a longstanding feature of their security policy, uh, we, basically to uh, remind, the Pal remind the neighboring Arab states, Palestinians included, but neighboring Arab states as well, about who's in charge and what are the consequences of uh, challenging Israel. Uh, you saw that, for example, in the 1960s. It goes back quite a ways, but I'll um, fast forward to the, 19, the 1967 war. Uh, it was quite clear, and Israel knew it. We know for sure Israel knew it. We knew two things. Number one, that Nasser did not intend to attack on the eve of the Israeli first strike. And number two, even if he did attack, and uh, even if he did it in concert with neighboring Arab states, Jordan and Syria, that the war would be over very quickly. Uh, famously, Secretary of Defense Robert McNamara, he predicted that the war would last seven to ten days, uh, and he was always proud of that prediction. In fact, the war was over in, uh, in the first day uh, because Israel, in its first strike, uh, demolished all of Egyptian planes on the ground, so the war was over. The only reason it lasted seven days is because Israel then proceeded to take land in the Jordan, take land in the Golan Heights. Uh, it wasn't even seven days, it was really one day, and the whole thing was over. Uh, What's the evidence, uh, and what is the evidence so people who haven't followed the story that Israel knew that Egypt wasn't going okay, to Okay, uh, that, that's a good question. Um, the evidence is as follows. The evidence I prefer to, to uh, uh, lean on. There's all sorts of evidence, but I'll use the evidence I prefer to lean on. Most people quote the famous statement by uh, uh, Prime Minister Menachem Begin at the National War College of Israel in July 1982. It was during the Lebanon War. And Menachem Begin uh, had been a member of the National Unity Government that was formed in 1967, so he knew all the inner workings. And he famously said in this um, 19, July 1982 lecture at the National War College, he said, let's be honest with ourselves. Uh, uh, there was no evidence that, uh, that uh, NASA was going to attack. We decided to attack first. But that to me is, um, that's some evidence. It's not necessarily definitive evidence because Begin at that time was trying to defend his decision to attack Lebanon in June 1982. The internal evidence, which I con consider overwhelmingly um, uh, overwhelmingly 
uh, supportive of what I'm about to say is um, the Israelis, they desperately needed in 1967, they needed the U.S. green light because they were afraid if they attacked like they did in 1956, that the U.S. president is going to force them to withdraw, just like Eisenhower forced Israel to withdraw in 1956. So they wanted that American green light, so once they attacked, they wouldn't be forced to unilaterally withdraw. And so they were sending all of their officials here uh, to show evidence that we are facing a existential threat from Egypt. Uh, Egypt is going to attack. And so Johnson took all the evidence, uh, Lyndon Johnson, the president at the time, he gave it to like six or seven uh, U.S. security uh, organizations, the equivalent of like, I don't know if it's the same name now, then, but it was like the National Security Council, the CIA, all of the organizations. He asked them, okay, vet the Israeli information, use your own information, what do you come back with? And each time he checked with them, they kept saying, there's no evidence that Egypt is going to attack. And he also, they also said, if there were an attack, and even if it were a concerted attack, uh, it's clear that Israel is going to, in the famous statement, Johnson I was talking to an Israeli official, I think it was Abba Eben, the foreign minister, but I can't say for sure, and he says that all our intelligence shows us, number one, Egypt is not going to attack, and number two, if they do, and Johnson's famous line was, you're going to whip the hell out of them. Now, you might say, well, that says what the Americans thought. What about what the Israelis thought? It's very interesting. On June 1st, that's just a few days before the Israeli attack, the head of Israeli intelligence, Meyer Amit, he comes to Washington. He's consulting. He's also trying to convince, and he's also trying to sniff out what will the U.S. do if we attack. He meets with the Isra American intelligence, and what does he say? He says, our intelligence agrees with all of your intelligence about whether Nasser will attack and what will happen if he attacks. So there's complete agreement across the board, American intelligence agencies, Israeli intelligence agencies, Nasser is not going to attack. Nasser, even if he did, we will whip, Israelis will whip the hell out of right. them. Which brings us now back to your question. The question is, then why did Israel attack? And the response, one of the responses, the one by Ariel Sharon, because there was a split in the cabinet, whether or not, Israeli cabinet, whether to launch the first strike. And Sharon said, if we don't, this was Ariel Sharon, it's the same cast of characters, goes back quite a ways. Ariel Sharon, he says, if we don't attack, it's going to diminish our deterrence capacity. What does that mean? Because Nasser was making all of these noises, Nasser did close the Straits of Tehran, Nasser did move troops into the Sinai, uh, and Nasser, you know, the rhetorical flourishes about we're going to defeat Israel and so on and so forth, and so had whipped up a kind of ecstatic hysteria in the Arab world. Finally, they're challenging Israel. Now, de facto, de facto, Nasser was a windbag, uh, a congenital problem in the Arab world. Um, leaders who are windbags, and obviously there was nothing backing his claims, but they thought that this was whipping up too much of a hysteria in the Arab world. It's time to remind them who's in charge. So then we get That's this term deterrence capacity. Deterrence capacity. And incidentally, the, f the expression turkey shoot, that came from the national security advisor, Walt Rastow. And he says, well, yeah, it was, a, uh, the Israelis attacked. He said, well, it was more like a turkey shoot, which is what it was. And I should, I should mention, mm -hmm. in, in Method and Madness, the, mm -hmm. all the sources for this are there. So if you mm -hmm. want to know how we know so-and-so said mm -hmm. what they said, check out the book, because it's, it's, it's very, uh, the notations are very detailed. Mm -hmm. um, well, then, uh, and, uh, Yeah, so now to bring it up to, to mm -hmm. date, um, to where we begin with Gaza, because the book effectively begins Let's, with... Uh, before you do yeah. that, I want to get to... Deterrence capacity runs into some trouble in a place called Lebanon. That's exactly where I was going to get to. Yeah. That's exactly. We're on the same wavelength. Um, so the book begins with the Israeli attack on Gaza, Operation Cast Lead, in 2008, uh, uh, December 27th, 2008, to July 17, January 17th, 2009. So what was the Israeli purpose behind that?
uh, its deterrence capacity, its ability to frighten, terrify the Arab world, uh, it suffered a real blow during the uh, July-August 2006 war in Lebanon. Uh, Israel went in with the full force uh, of its um, high-tech killing machine, uh, inflicted massive death and destruction. About 1,200 Lebanese were killed. Of those 1,200, about 1,000 were civilians. 200 were Hezbollah fighters. Um, but Israel was very careful not to launch a ground invasion because you don't want to go to war hand-to-hand -hand combat with the party of God, the Hezbollah. I've met Hezbollah fighters. They're serious and they want nothing more than to tangle with Israelis. And Israeli soldiers did not want to tangle with the God, party of God. The long and the short of it was Israel as I say, used this high-tech killing machine for about three weeks' time. Well, it was 34 days, but uh, after uh, about, uh, okay, let's call it four weeks' time. Uh, and uh, then it was clear that the only option now was to launch the ground invasion because the Hezbollah had these... Um, what year are we in? Uh, 2006. Uh, Hezbollah, Israel claims it knocked out the medium and long-term missiles. I don't know if that's necessarily true, but it's for argument's sake accepted. The problem was these short-range rockets that Hezbollah had. You can't disable them from the air. The only way you can disable them was with a ground invasion. And Hezbollah kept firing more and more and more, not inflicting massive damage, but showing it's still resisting. The only way to get rid of them is, as I said, through a ground invasion. Israel did not want a ground invasion because it knew it would suffer significant combatant casualties. And so Condoleezza Rice in the uh, UN was blocking any resolution ending the conflict. But then it was clear we better end this now because we're in a mess. And so Condoleezza Rice finally uh, allowed the resolution to pass in the Security Council and the uh, Lebanon so-called, uh, what well, was a war in some ways, was over. It was horrible what the Israelis did at the end. It's all completely forgotten. The resolution was passed. The war was over. All that was waiting was now implementation on the ground. Everybody agreed, war is over. What did Israel do in the last 72 hours? It's all completely uh, eliminated from the historical record. It dropped four million, four million cluster bomblets on South Lebanon, saturated the whole of South Lebanon. It was like a science fiction movie. How do, we, how do we know this? Oh, you just look at um, um, uh, the Human Rights Watch report. Uh, on South, it's called Flooding South Lebanon. Uh, it's a very vivid depiction of the monstrousness of what Israel did. It depicts homes, the roofs, through the windows, the cluster bomblets, and their entire apartments are just saturated with them. Four million cluster bomblets. In any case, that's a separate issue. Maybe one day I'll come back and talk about. But for now, the point is uh, Nasrallah kept referring to it as our divine Nez victory. Nasrallah, leader of the Hezbollah. Yeah, the head of the Hezbollah, Sayyid Nasrallah, kept referring to it as our divine victory. And that, of course, shook up the Israelis because it was like Nasser, but with a real victory. And it was time they had to figure out a way to restore their deterrence capacity. And they chose Gaza. And in a typical cowardly way, they chose a place which was utterly defenseless. Uh, and then proceed to uh, prove how tough they are. Prove how tough they are against a defenseless victim. Uh, in Operation Cast led about uh, 1,400 Palestinians this were killed. 2009. 2008, 9, mm. uh, of whom about uh, up to 1,200 were civilians. They left behind uh, 600,000 tons of rubble, uh, which is actually. Uh, it paled in comparison to what they did during Operation uh, the, uh, Protective Edge this past summer. Protective Edge was much worse, uh, but it also was different because uh, the Palestinians did manage to produce, uh, to build uh, the tunnel system. 
And because of the tunnel system, uh, they were able, the tunnel system was, the tunnels were not vulnerable to artillery strikes or air attacks. They were pretty impressive. Uh, anyone who knows the Arab world knows every, uh, four out of every three, pal every three Palestinians is a civil engineer. And in Gaza, you have a lot of unemployed civil engineers. And so with very primitive um, implements, they actually built a very impressive, uh, sophisticated a catacombs tunnel system in Gaza. And so when Israel went in, it never went very far in. There's a misunderstanding about that. They basically stayed on the border because the Palestinians were coming, were coming out, the, Hez, the Hamas fighters were coming out of the tunnels. And there was, it's not Stalingrad, it's not Leningrad, but uh, in the first operation cast led uh, ten Israeli combatants were killed. Of those ten, four of the ten were killed from friendly fire, which means only six were actually killed uh, by his Hamas fighters. This time it was different. It was 67 Israeli combatants who were killed. And they were basically killed for two reasons. First of all, the Hamas fighters appear to have been more sophisticated this time. It's said they were trained by Hezbollah, but I don't know. But secondly, it was that tunnel system. But your main, your main point here is, mm -hmm. is, is that the fundamental reasons for attacking Gaza is to sort of reassert the fear factor. A fear factor, but there was also a, a second factor, which I discuss at equal length, which is the peace offensive, that every time Hamas was becoming too respectable, every time Hamas was becoming too reasonable, every time Hamas was upholding the terms of the ceasefire that it signed with Israel, there was the fear by Israel that somebody will say, well, if they're respecting agreements, if they're carrying on in a responsible fashion, then why don't you negotiate with them? And the Israelis have a nice, or one Israeli political scientist, his name is Avner Yaniv, he quoted a nice expression, uh, he coined a nice expression, he called it the fear of Palestinian peace offensives. They're becoming too reasonable. And so we have to hit them hard so that the quote-unquote radical and extremist elements will gain the upper hand internally. Uh, so every time there's a Palestinian peace offensive, uh, Israel uh, launches one of its um, uh, and murderous inv and, invasions. And, and, and that's and the, exactly and, and, the, and the sort of, I guess, one of the nightmares of the Israelis in terms of all this is, is some reunification with Hamas and Fatah and the PLO. And that's exactly what happened. They, had, they created this unity government. Right. And that's actually how, that's the proper starting point for what happened in Gaza this past summer. It was what's called the Government of National Consensus that was formed at the end of April uh, 2014. And um, uh, surprisingly, the United States and the European Union, they did not immediately break off relations with the new government because technically Hamas is, you know, uh, has a terrorist organization in the U.S., terrorist organization in the EU. So you would have expected the U.S. would break off relations, and the EU would, but they did not. Part of it, I think, it was punishment because of the Kerry Peace Initiative, which was sabotaged by Netanyahu, and they wanted to get even with him for that. So they said, no, we'll take a wait-and-see approach with the Hamas government. And this inflamed and incensed uh, uh, Netanyahu because this is the second time these countries are dealing with terrorists. The first, of course, is Iran. They're in the midst of these negotiations with this government that's threatening a second Holocaust against Israel and all that sort of nonsense. And now they're negotiating with Hamas, which you know, wants to destroy Israel. Uh, but all um, uh, Netanyahu could do was fume. He, didn't really, he wasn't able to do anything about it until, <coughs> excuse me, in June of this past year, uh, when the three kidnappings occurred of the Israeli teenagers he found his opportunity. Uh, he decided to use that as a pretext. He knew the kids were killed, were dead almost within 24 hours. He knew all so that. So he didn't have to go looking for them. Yeah, and yeah. it was also known almost right away that Hamas leadership were it, not in on Exactly. This, so. He knew all that. And, but they used it as a pretext to launch what they called Operation. In, in your book, you call it a gift. It's, uh, yeah, they, they are gifts. But these are politicians. You know, sometimes people feel like when you say expression like gift, that's just a little bit too callous. They're politicians. 
after 9-11, yes, Rumsfeld, Condoleezza Rice, Cheney, they got in their little office, they shed their salty tears, and then 15 minutes later they said, now, what are we going to do with it? Now let's get down to serious business. We're not here to cry. And it's the same thing with Israel. Okay, three kids are killed, we're not happy about that. Now, what can we do with it? Uh, and so he launches Operation Brothers Keeper, goes on the, uh, Israeli troops go on the rampage in the West Bank, uh, kill Palestinians, demolish Palestinian homes, um, arrest 500 militants from Hamas, knowing full well that this is going to evoke uh, a violent reaction from Hamas, and then when they get that violent reaction, they can say exactly... Violent reaction meaning some uh, rockets that ro basically rockets, don't hit very much. Right, or some th crazy thing, whatever is going to happen, and then Netanyahu can say, as he did say uh, a, few month, a few weeks later, he said, quote, never second-guess me again on Hamas. When I say they're a terrorist organization, they're a terrorist organization. Now he had his proof. Uh, and so uh, he exploited the opportunity. Because as long as he can keep Hamas as a terrorist organization out of the talks, any possibility of any res uh, reconciliation or deal is off the table. Right, because he then says the Palestinian Authority doesn't represent all Palestinians. So how can we negotiate a deal with them? Uh, the whole purpose is... Totally and, and he comes to Congress and they stand up 27 times or whatever the crazy number of standing ovations was. Mm -hmm. But now he, uh, I think he went a little too far with the last visit to Congress. Okay, we're going to talk about mm -hmm. that and where we're at in the next segment. Mm -hmm. Please join us for a continuation of our discussion with Norman Finkelstein on Reality Asserts Itself on the Real News Network.